the Speaker has the right to visit Taiwan, and the Speaker of the House has visited Taiwan before, without incident. The world has seen the United States government be very clear that nothing has changed. Nothing has changed about our one China policy. I think it's a mistake for the Speaker to go to Taipei. The goal of, of foreign policy with respect to China is to reduce tensions, not to increase tensions. And her visit to Taiwan will clearly increase tension. I think we've never seen an economy coming out of a shutdown like this at a moment like this. I'm optimistic that um, it, that this can be managed without having a full-blown deep recession, um, but it's not out of the question. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacqua. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francie Lanka here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Tensions over Taiwan. The U.S. urges calm from Beijing as Nancy Pelosi is expected to visit the island today. Caution abounds while stocks and U.S. futures sell off as markets angst rise. Plus, BP buyback. The super major plans to return $3.5 billion to shareholders after reporting a beat on profits. Now, the market's definitely, definitely on tender hooks because of the U.S.-China tensions. We had a pretty full-on briefing from the highest-ranking foreign ministry spokesman from China. The last time she did this daily briefing was right after the invasion of Ukraine by Russia. Now, in it, she did not mince words. She was really warning the U.S. about unintended consequences, and it's very clear that this escalating conflict between the U.S. and China um, could lead to consequences that the market doesn't really know how to trade. But there's a move towards havens, and also there's a, a move because they're concerned about the U.S. economy. Uh, European stocks uh, down some four-tenths of 8 percent, a similar move for S&P futures, and then the U.S. 10-year yield. Again, you can see a bid into government bonds, yen, 130 88. So overall, European stocks, now they're a little bit different depending on where you look at. For example, uh, the FTSE 100, if we look at the European map, the FTSE 100, one of uh, the indices in Europe that was losing the least. So you can see now it's pretty much flat. This is because of the weighting of BP, one of the biggest companies. BP is gaining 4.4% because they're giving back to shareholders in terms of dividends, but also share buyback because their profits were so large. So that's a different story, for example, to a DAX where you see half a percent lower or a cap 40, three-tenths of a percent lower. Now, our top story today, the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi set to land in uh, Taiwan this afternoon, likely making her the highest ranking U.S. politician to visit the island in 25 years. Now, the trip escalates tensions between China and the U.S., with Beijing warning of consequences should the visit go ahead. Well, joining us now is Samson Ellis. He's Taipei bureau chief and John Liu in Beijing. So, Samson, first of all, what's Pelosi's plan while in Taiwan? Well, from what we understand, she is shortly about to start her visit uh, over here. She's going to land uh, later this evening, this evening, according to sources. Uh, it's obviously quite late at the night. There won't be anything tonight. But then uh, from tomorrow, uh, we do expect her to have a series of meetings, uh, obviously with President Tsai Ing-wen while she's here, uh, and also with a range of lawmakers while she's here and conduct, uh, you know, legislature to legislature, diplo diplomacy, so to speak. Um, it's expected to be a very short trip. So other than that, there's nothing uh, notable on the schedule as yet. So, uh, John, I mean, we're going through it together. There's this, you know, pretty extraordinary briefing. What kind of reaction could we see from China? Their uh, utmost uh, anger at the potential visit by uh, Speaker Pelosi and trying to warn the U.S. off from doing it. I think. If uh, Ms. Pelosi were to call off the visit now, it would be seen as a fairly big victory for Beijing. I think that's probably reason why she is definitely going to visit Taiwan, uh, arriving tonight, as uh, Samson was saying. Uh, what, what could Beijing do in response? They've promised some resolute measures. Uh, we've seen in the past uh, Chinese warplanes flying into the air defense zone of Taiwan. We've seen back in the late 90s missiles fired by China uh, into waters close to some Taiwanese ports. Uh, there has been some suggestion by uh, commentators here in Beijing that the PLA could fly jets to escort Ms. Pelosi's plane. That would be extremely provocative. Uh, there's been a lot of rhetoric now. We just have to wait for the action. We certainly do. Samson, what would a visit mean for Taiwan? Well, obviously, Taiwan is often 
very hungry for this type of international exposure or any type of international exposure, you know, it being largely cut off from, from much of the international conversation. Um, and, and so Taiwan usually welcomes high level visitors um, because it doesn't get too many of them. Uh, and so typically, uh, you know, they do welcome these with open arms. Uh, but in this case, you know, there has been you know, very stern warnings from the Chinese side about potential consequences. Uh, of, of a visit should it happen. Uh, uh, and so we've seen the first um, salvo, so to speak, in terms of uh, reaction from China today. There, there does appear to be a lot of uh, military act activity in the Taiwan Strait. These are all unconfirmed reports for now. Um, but one thing that did happen late last night, though, is that uh, China did uh, enact a ban on uh, food imports from Taiwan. Yeah. So this is the latest uh, in a series of economic uh, coercion from the Chinese side. Yeah, I mean, extremely difficult, of course, to game theory this on, on to see how China could hit back over Pelosi's Taiwan visit. But John, through your you know years and decades of experience, why is Nancy Pelosi so intent on going to Taiwan, especially at a time where you also you know have this fractious with China being much closer to Russia than we thought when the invasion of Ukraine happened. I think the invasion of Ukraine has uh, led many people in the United States to believe that Taiwan could be like the Ukraine and could be uh, uh, the target, the victim of some incursion by China. And so that has added to uh, this calling, this effort to try and strengthen Taiwan's defenses. I think that's why in the recent past you've seen a number of uh, lawmakers, congressional delegations, uh, former secretaries of defense visiting. Uh, Taiwan, trying to show uh, not only American but international support for Taiwan. I think we're expecting some British lawmakers to visit as well in the near future. Uh, that, I think, is the backdrop. I think the Chinese, uh, the more international support there is for Taiwan uh, as, as a state separate from the mainland, I think the more that draws China into a situation where it feels like it has to react very strongly to show a very strong hand in that situation, especially with uh, a very important party, Congress, coming later this year where President Xi Jinping is expected to secure uh, a precedent-breaking third term, so not really much yeah. room for China to maneuver politically here. Yeah, and, and Samson, I know we, we look at it from, you know, through a foreign policy lens, but if you look at the Taiwan Strait, this is one of the primary routes of ships passing from China, Japan, South Korea to points in the West. So how much shipping disruption could we see if, if, if something ugly were to happen there? Well, that's precisely the question a lot of uh, security analysts in this part of the world are desperately trying to, to ascertain. As you said, it's an incredibly important uh, shipping route, you know, in both directions, you know, uh, oil uh, uh, and the like, and, and or up to uh, the places like Shanghai and, further, and Japan uh, further afield, uh, and then all the manufactured goods out of China um, and to the rest of the world. Uh, and so that is one of the fears right now that we are increasingly hearing from analysts is that even a small disruption and also at a time where the shipping industry is battling back from uh, the COVID disruptions that has created an incredible backlog in the industry um, and that even the smallest uh, disruption in this crucial area could have really quite severe unintended consequences. All right. Thank you both for joining us. Samson Elisera, Taipei Bureau Chief, and of course our Executive Editor for Greater China. He is John Liu. We'll have plenty more on this. And if anyone has a Bloomberg terminal, we have a wonderful blog really going through the nuances of some of that briefing from China that finished about 15 minutes ago. Now, for all of the latest market moves, we're also joined by Bloomberg's Justina Liu. Justina, thank you for joining us. I mean, I don't even know how to start trading this because actually we don't exactly know the consequences would be unclear, frankly, to me, despite that terrific briefing from Samsung and John, why Nancy Pelosi would go ahead with this. So what are you seeing on the markets? Right, exactly. I mean, it really is like a textbook case of risk aversion today. And it really is, you know, the market's knee-jerk reaction to what is potentially a very serious geopolitical risk. And so we're seeing, you know, the dollar and the yen go up. Bonds coming down, uh, bonds going up as well, and also kind of yeah. stocks coming down. And of course, this is kind of all happening in a context where markets were already getting increasingly concerned about a recession. So, are we just going to see more of a bid for for Treasuries? I know there was a bit of a quirk with yen, for example. 
Right, exactly. I mean, I think there are like two things going on. I mean, one is like this is, you know, these rising tensions between the world's two big superpowers can potentially be very severe in markets. And on yeah. the other hand, I mean, investors are starting to think about, you know, dialing back expectations possibly for Fed tightening because perhaps they are winning the inflation fight after all or perhaps the economic growth is slowing. And so I think those two things are both kind of helping to bring down Treasury yields right now. I mean, it's kind of one of those days where market participants are suddenly like foreign policy experts again, especially with the Taiwan Strait. What exactly is priced in? Just a, some kind of like skirmish geopolitically, or are we going to have to look at that shipping? And I know our Valerie put together, you know, we have all this wealth of information on the Bloomberg terminal. We actually see the, the Taiwan Strait and what it means for shipping worldwide. Yeah, I think the sense is like even though we have had, you know, rising tensions between the two parties for a while, I don't think people kind of have really thought seriously about the prospect of a serious conflict. And I don't think that's kind of currently what the market is expecting yet. I mean, look at that. It's beautiful. Like, I, I'm still in awe of what we can do with the Bloomberg Terminal because that's individual ships. And actually, if you, if you wait close enough, you can see them move. I mean, it, it already prices for freight that, you know, could go up significantly if, if we see something and that's straight happening. Yeah, and today, you know, we saw a big reaction in the Taiwan dollar, which normally doesn't really move. And part of that is people are also worried about economic consequences for Taiwan. And at the same time, you know, Taiwan is kind of a big place for um, semiconductor production. And so there could be implications kind of beyond its shores and for a lot of tech companies as well. Justina, thank you so much. Justina Lee with the very latest, of course, on this. We'll have plenty more on some of the Haven bids and we'll see exactly what happens in the next couple of hours. Coming up, the BOE expected this week to push through the biggest interest rate hike since the mid 90s. More on their battle against inflation next. This is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Francis Lacroix here in London. Now let's focus on central banks. Reserve Bank of Australia raised its key interest rate by 50 basis points to 1.85% as expected by most economists surveyed by Bloomberg. Now the bank holds the view that inflation will peak over the coming months and that they're open-minded about the size of rate hikes from here. Now on the subject of 50 basis points, the Bank of England also expected to deliver its biggest rate hike in 27 years this week. Now the UK central bank will also unveil its strategy for unwinding winding some of the 895 billion pounds of stimulus it has delivered over the past decade. Well, with us now is the chief European economist at PGM, Catherine Nice. Catherine, thank you for joining us. First of all, when you look at inflation, I'm looking at the wrong camera. There you are, Catherine. When you look at inflation, when you look exactly at what kind of inflation the, the central banks can take care of in the world, can, can, you know, can they even engineer a soft landing? How much in, in, in a tricky situation is the Bank of England right now? The bank is in a very tri tricky situation. It's a little bit piggy in the middle between what we're seeing in the US and in the Euro area. And uh, those, those economies uh, are facing very challenging situations themselves. So it's a, it's a bit amplified, I would say, here in the UK. You make the point about the drivers of inflation. And in the UK, uh, we're getting hit with the double whammy of both a very tight labor market that's leading to a higher domestic inflationary pressure, as well as, of course, these higher energy prices that we're seeing on the continent feeding through and impacting on the UK economy as well. So the bank will want to strike a balance between, in some ways, uh, looking through some of the pressures that we're seeing on inflation, as we're seeing just now, and yet ensuring yeah. that this does not become recurring uh, inflationary pressure going forward. Catherine, do they have a harder job, actually, than e even the ECB in certain respects? And they had the first mover man advantage. Has the BOE now squandered that? The, the Bank of England has been an early and consistent uh, rate-hiking central bank. And my view is that that should stand it in good stead. Uh, I expect to see them to continue to raise rates at uh, the meeting later this week and perhaps uh, for uh, a month or two still to come. But that said, 
Uh, we are expecting the economic impact of the shocks that we've been experiencing over the course of this year to start to come home and really impact on the real side of the economy. And that should curb the Bank of England from raising rates uh, substantially further, uh, I would have thought. Catherine, what do you most worry about? The ECB or the Bank of England? Who's in danger of underwhelming the, the markets more? And sh should they be worried about underwhelming markets? Well, they both face their own very unique challenges. The additional factor that uh, I think will weigh on the minds of uh, the Bank of England in a way perhaps uh, less so for the ECB is what's happening to uh, the exchange rate here. So uh, we've seen that the, in, the, in the US, the Fed has, has taken a very uh, aggressive rate hiking uh, path and that is weighing substantially on sterling. It's weighing on the euro as well, but the UK is a much smaller open economy. This really does translate into meaningful upward pressure on UK inflation yeah. in a way that it doesn't in the euro area. So that's going to be an additional factor that the MPC is going to need to think about here at the, uh, at the Bank of England. But Catherine, is there anything actually that anyone can do to push back against King Dollar or ever higher? Well, I think because if central banks are setting policy uh, mainly to influence exchange rates, it's, it's probably a losing game. Uh, the, the Bank of England will need to set policy that's appropriate to the domestic economy. But that said, it is a smaller uh, developed market economy that has a flexible exchange rate. And so you could see uh, the Bank of England to a degree getting pushed to have to raise rates more aggressively than perhaps it would like to, given the state of the domestic economy here in the UK, simply because uh, the exchange rate does have such a meaningful impact on headline inflation. Um, Catherine, I know we're in like, you know, politics right now because there's this race on who will be the next prime minister and who will lead the, the Conservative Party going forward. But given the two candidates, can they really change the outlook for the UK economy depending on what they put in place in terms of taxes, but also, you know, paying some of the civil servants? Well, as you say, both of these candidates are going to be much more aligned in terms of being uh, fiscally conservative. But there is probably um, a bit of chink of light between them from, from how they've been campaigning. Whether they are able to actually put some of those through, uh, whoever uh, ends up being successful in, in the leadership bid, I think does remain an open question. Whoever does uh, win, I would expect us to see a little bit more fiscal support coming through, given that uh, this shock just is not going away. And if anything, yep. looks like it's intensifying in terms of the squeeze on cost of living. So I would expect whoever we end up with as leader, we are going to see a bit more fiscal support and uh, that, that will help at the margin. But whether it's really going to change the course of the macroeconomic outlook, I'm, I'm probably a bit more uh, skeptical on that. Catherine, thank you so much. Catherine Nieser, Chief European Economist at PGM, joining us on this extremely important week. Coming up, Credit Suisse's credit outlook caught negative by S&P Global Ratings. More on the embattled Swiss bank in just a few minutes. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Let's get straight to the Bloomberg. First world news, here's Laura Wright. Hi, Laura. Hi, Francine. The man who took over the leadership of al-Qaeda from Osama bin Laden has been killed in a U.S. drone strike in Afghanistan. President Biden approved the strike and confirmed the killing of Ayman al-Zawahiri, which took place in Kabul over the weekend. The U.S. says he helped plan the 9-11 terrorist attacks. China's top leaders are said to have told government officials this year's economic growth target is only guidance. Bloomberg understands it was made clear the GDP growth target of around 5.5% won't be used to evaluate performance and there won't be penalties for missing it. 
Ukraine has laid out plans to ramp up grain exports following its first shipment since Russia's invasion. The shipment was hailed as an encouraging first step to unblocking millions of tons of crops and easing global food prices. The first two weeks will be treated as a trial period with no more than three vessels a day passing each direction through new safe passage corridors. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg Francine. Thank you so much, Laura Wright, with the very latest, of course, of our top news. Now, speaking of top news, what the market is looking at is that Nancy Pelosi trip to Taiwan, the standoff between the U.S. and China over Taiwan has really also thrown a spotlight on growing risk to one of the world's busiest shipping lanes, even a minor disruption could actually ripple through supply chains. Now, that's putting a lot of pressure on some of these European stocks. You can see uh, they're down some five-tenths of eight percent, similar loss for the DAX, half a percent lower. If you look at the FTSE, it's gaining one-tenth of eight percent, but this is really because BP giving back to shareholders in terms of dividends, in terms of buybacks, and BP is such a big company for the FTSE 100 as a whole. Coming up, we'll have plenty more on some of these reporting uh, companies. We talk HSBC. More on that story next. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition, and here are your top stories. Tensions over Taiwan. The U.S. are just calm from Beijing, as Nancy Pelosi is expected to visit the island today. Caution abounds while well, stocks and the U.S. futures sell off as market angst rises. Plus, BP buyback. The super major plans to return $3.5 billion to shareholders after reporting a beat on profits. Now, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, first thing is first, let's check in, as always, on the markets. We're seeing a lot of anxiousness out there. This is because of these rising tensions between the U.S. and Taiwan. Again, the standoff between the two countries over Taiwan has also thrown a spotlight on some of the growing risks when it comes to the world's busiest shipping lanes. Even a minor disruption could ripple through supply chains. That exactly is where markets are trying to price in a clear bid uh, to some of the havens, including government bonds with the U.S. at 10-year yield at 2.56. European stocks down by about half a percent, as is the S&P futures. Now, spooked by years of scandals, losses and an ongoing leadership shakeup, Credit Suisse has handed out more than $300 million in a month to retain top bankers. But last week, the chairman, Axel Lehman, also discussed how the bank plans to keep talent. Why should... I stay at Credit Suisse if I'm an employee holding stock that's 60% lower than when Gottstein arrived. Why should I stay here? Because they look forward. There's huge potential. Will you have any problem fulfilling the strategic mandates that you have from institutional clients? Is it going to be tough to keep people here at the bank? Sure. You need to manage that. You need to speak to people. But, you know, our people are excited about the way forward. Now, let's bring in Bloomberg's UK finance team leader. He is Tom Metcalf. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. I feel like you're my recruiter special because you understand the intricacies of these investment bankers. If you continue having, even if you're paid millions more, if you continue having Credit Suisse on your CV, are you tainted? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a franchise right now which is really in trouble. And I think you're seeing that in terms of people leaving that en masse. So that's why you're kind of seeing this reaction from the bank that in order to keep their best talent, they're really having to make these pretty big, pretty extraordinary retention payments. So some of the details we've heard is, you know, you get a rainmaker being guaranteed, guaranteed $10 million over two years. So it's those incredible. kind of steps. Yeah, I mean, made me very jealous. And, and uh, you reminded me, you know, the 300 million that they're basically paying out and, and an extra compensation to keep the, the good talent is not over the year. This is what, over a four month period? No, 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 one month. So one it month. was basically disclosed. 300 million in, in yeah. one month they're dishing out. So that is just the month of July. So, and that compares to like that kind of figure for the whole of last Year. So it shows I think they're really struggling to keep people and they're really having to take some big steps. So what does it tell us about the situation at Credit Suisse? They've also hired actually some, some high profile people. Yeah, so look, they came out at results and said, hey, we're trying to pivot towards a sort of capital light advisory led model. So it seems that they're really diving into kind of trying to keep rainmakers, trying to attract that kind of talent. And obviously one of the levers they can pull is 
is the money lever. Yeah. But obviously, you know, talent looks at all sorts of things. And, and you're right, you know, is Credit Suisse a bit too tainted right now, even if you're being offered big money to, to join? Tom, thank you so much. Tom Metcalf there, one of our uh, team leaders for UK and EMEA finance. Now, on to another big bank story. And in just a few hours, executives at HSBC will try something they have not in three years, meeting face to face with their uneasy shareholders in Hong Kong. We're joking. We're telling about the, the average, I guess, age of that shareholder. Now, the bank caught in a crossfire between the US and China, retail traders and executives, backers of its global model and its largest shareholder. Well, here to discuss all of these tensions, Charlie Wells from Bloomberg News. Charlie, so much, so much writing on today's meeting in Hong Kong. And actually, usually, I mean, they get yelled at, right, by, you know, shareholders oh, yeah. that come, I'm not saying Zimmer frame, but certainly saying, why is my share price not good enough? So what kind of line are the chairman um, and chief executive going to tell? Well, this is a really dramatic day for a bank that does not like drama, right? So we have seen over the past few months Ping On Insurance Group calling for the Asia unit of HSBC to be split off. And what's an interesting twist here is that these retail investors are also falling in line with that position. Retail investors make up about a third of the shareholders of HSBC. Mm -hmm. They've been really upset about dividend payments being canceled during the pandemic and they want change. Yeah, they certainly do want change. That's putting up HSBC. Who's for it? Who's against it? Okay, so the retail <laughs> traders are generally for those Hong Kong based retail traders. Uh, Ping On Insurance, of course, for that as well. And what they say is that the H HSBC's Asia unit is more profitable, right? About 65% of profits come from there. They see more value creation. One study showed about, uh, I think it was maybe several billion dollars in value created from that, yeah. as well as control over those dividends. Of course, HSBC executives have been making the case this week, and presumably well very soon, that the bank should stick together, that it would be too risky to split up, that it would be too costly, and that if you look under the hood of profitability, you actually see that that business from Asia, a lot of that is actually business from outside outside the region that could potentially disappear if that unit were to be spun out. So, uh, Charlie, give me a sense of, I mean, is this pressure that's not only for some of the big banks, but are we going to see pressures on, you know, in general, big companies mm. refocusing on Hong Kong so that you yep. know what you're looking at in terms yeah. of value? Yeah, Francine, you're hitting on that huge issue right now. And really, Exhibit A here is Alibaba, right? So Alibaba is looking for a primary listing in Hong Kong. Um, politicians who have sided with retail traders in Hong Kong have said that they want HSBC to potentially do something similar to list in Hong Kong. Um, that could be very complicated and difficult, but it shows that there is pressure between companies who sit in both Asia and in the West to pick a side. Yeah, biggest story that we're covering so far. Charlie, thank you so much. Charlie Wells there looking at all of the banks, especially HSBC. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Laura Wright. Hi, Laura. Hi, Francine. Maersk has raised its profit forecast for the second time this year after congestion on trade lanes boosted global freight rates. The Danish company, which controls about a sixth of the world's container trade, has benefited from a shortage of shipping capacity, what it called an exceptional market situation. Maersk says earnings before interest and tax will be around $31 billion this year, far above its previous forecast for $24 billion. There's a report that Esther Lauder is in talks to buy the luxury fashion brand Tom Ford. According to the Wall Street Journal, a deal could be worth $3 billion or more. Tom Ford is known for its menswear, although it also sells women's clothing, cosmetics and fragrances. Pinterest shares jumped more than 20% in late trade after it reported resilient sales and user numbers, and Elliott Investment Management confirmed a major stake in the company. The search and discovery platform says it had 433 million monthly active users in the latest period, broadly unchanged, but better than analysts had forecast. That's the Bloomberg Business Flash, Francine. Thank you so much, Laura. Coming up, BP boosting dividends and buybacks. That's as the oil giant's profit rose to the highest since 2008 this quarter. We'll have plenty more on that story next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, China has slammed the U.S. over Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. Our reporter was at the press conference. It's uh, Colin Murphy, and he's in Beijing now. Colin, we had some pretty, pretty stark warnings from uh, the Chinese. It was the highest-ranking foreign official to give that briefing, something that we hadn't seen since Russia invaded Ukraine. What could they do in retaliation? 
So yes, I'm standing as you can see outside the foreign ministry here, and as you mentioned, that they did roll out uh, Hua Chunying, which is like already a signal. It's quite rare that she comes to talk to us, and today was one of those rare occasions. Um, she basically was talking about uh, certain things, uh, some of it quite menacing, such as, for example, the U.S. will pay the price for undermining China's interests. And she also warned that Taiwan itself would face disastrous consequences uh, if this uh, U.S. side misjudges or miscalculates over the Taiwan Strait. Uh, she criticized the U.S. and Washington for backtracking and for hollowing out this one China principle. And she reiterated that they, the Chinese side had, on many, many different occasions, uh, communicated with the U.S. side and that they were uh, hopeful that the U.S. side would get the message very, very clear uh, yeah. that the Chinese side are, are obviously uh, hugely uh, displeasure, has huge displeasure over this trip by Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan. But so, Colin, I, I mean, I'm sure they're trying to deter Nancy Pelosi from going to Taiwan. It's probably a little too late. So I could be wrong on that. But we're also speaking to our executive editor, Jean Lu, who is saying, you know, what we could see is Nancy Pelosi's plane, which is a military U.S. plane, is my understanding, escorted by one or two or more Chinese planes. I mean, how would that go down? Well, I think that would be like the ultimate in terms of provocation uh, from the Chinese side. And, you know, we aren't, uh, there's a lot of speculation going on. There's a lot of talk going on. So it's really hard to say at this point. And you're right, there are still six hours to go. I mean, anything can happen between now and then. But there was one telling detail, which was uh, a, a meeting that's uh, taking place in Cambodia in the coming days. That's of the foreign ministers of the ASEAN. That's a group of nations in Southeast Asia. And both Anthony Blinken from the U.S. and also Wang Yi from China will be present at that meeting. However, there is no planned uh, bilateral meeting between the two. And that speaks volumes yeah. to a possible uh, <laughs> displeasure from the Chinese side over what's going on in the Taiwan Strait. However, uh, Hua did yeah. not rule out or did not dismiss the possibility of a visit, of an in-person visit or an in-person discussion between President Xi and President Biden, which uh, might take place, uh, was reported to be taking place later this year. Yeah, and I have to say, Colin, we need to talk a little bit about Taiwan Straits. Not many people know how significant this is as a shipping route, of course, from east to west. So we can track some of the movement in that strait thanks to Bloomberg Terminal. It's completely extraordinary. But what does, would this mean for, for ships? I mean, is this the, the biggest economic consequences we could see from something going wrong? It's definitely one of the biggest consequences. And again, depending on who you talk to, you get some people saying that the risk is, is not as much as we anticipated. But obviously, shipping is important, uh, not only for <coughs> countries like Japan and South Korea, but also for China itself. But I would also say, you know, look at the semiconductor industry. That's probably possibly even more significant in terms of what's at stake here. Because, of course, Taiwan is home to uh, TSMC, which is the, the world's largest chip uh, manufacturer. And uh, China is reliant on supplies from there, too. So whether it be shipping, whether it be chips, uh, there's definitely a lot of economic uh, factors at play here in the decision making. Yeah, extremely interesting. Colin, thank you so much, of course, for that terrific briefing on the ground there. He was at the press conference given by the highest ranking foreign official ministry from China, Colin Murphy, there in Beijing with the very latest on these political tensions. Now, U.S. Republicans are using an obscure rule named after the Senate's longest serving member to challenge provisions of the Democrats' surprise tax, health and climate deal. Now, that's as the part a party aims to whittle down the legislation. Now with us is Stephanie Kelly, head of thematic sustainability research at Red Wheel. Um, Stephanie, we have a lot to talk about. We are also going to talk about BP and actually looking at the transition. But for, for the moment, what's happening in the U.S. in terms of, you know, the, the focus on sustainability and the focus on cleaner energy, given all of the unknown with secure energy? This is, I think, in some ways, really links into some of the geopolitics you've been talking about earlier in the show, is what's really striking about the climate deal that the Democrats are trying to push through is in part around how they've used the language of energy security and, you know, specifically issues with Russia and with China to really reinforce that renewable energy and, and climate change is part of tackling sort of a geopolitical agenda as well, which I think is strengthening the hand 
of the discussion that's taking place. I think this week, the big question mark is going to be Kirsten Cinema. She's been relatively quiet. She hasn't said anything about this new bill. It's always been her and Joe Manchin who've kind of been the thorn in the side of Joe Biden trying to get climate done. Clearly now Manchin has been part of this bill. So the big question mark for this week is, does Kirsten Cinema come out in, in support? And if she does oppose, what parts of the bill does she oppose? Yeah, so what's your interpretation of the fact that we haven't heard, actually, what the intention was? So there's definitely some concerns growing in D.C. It's very evident. You can see over the weekend. I think the question mark is just why hasn't she come out and said anything? The expectation is she might have an issue specifically with one of the what's being described as kind of closing a loophole on, on investment profits. In the past, when she's been involved in that kind of bill in the House, she's kind of pushed against it. So it looks like it might not necessarily be the climate part of the bill that's going to cause issues, more so the tax side. And so this is where, again, climate always gets caught up in the politics. The short-term politics tends to kind of trump long-term climate change action. And we continue to see that not just in the U.S., but actually all over the Western world. But Stephanie, how does this actually change the domestic energy production and, and resource control in the U.S.? Given what's happening with Russia, given these you know escalating tensions between the U.S. and China, are the U.S. going to want to take much more control back? And so the short answer is is yes. And in particular, the advantage that renewable energy provides for a lot of countries, the U.S. specifically, is the more control you have over it. It's created in-house, right? So a wind farm or, or solar. It's a lot of it can be created in in-house and it's quite striking that in the climate deal that they're pushing in DC at the moment there's a lot of talk around specifically you know renewable energy investment resource production and that's all I think part of not just addressing climate change but also addressing energy security and ensuring that what you do kind of within a country can be really domestic onshoring um, and I think that's really borne out in this way and it kind of kills two birds with one stone for the Democrats. Um, Stephanie, we keep on talking, of course, about this transition into a greener economy, but when you look at, you know, the price but also demand for coal significantly rising, given all of these energy security uncertainty, what does it mean for the energy transition? Will we get there slower or are we just not going to get there? Well, this is, this is the, the big question mark that's come through in all the debates, right? In theory, you know, I've talked about it, energy security, Renewable energy is the answer for lots of countries, potentially. The problem is that takes time. You have to invest, you have to build the resources, you have to build the intellectual property. And so in the meantime, what you're seeing is, particularly in Europe, this kind of squeeze on, but we are still a fossil fuel reliant economy. And this is where I think we need to be really cautious. It's great to aspire to next year. It's really important to aspire to it. But we also have to address the reality, which is, as things stand, economies really run on fossil fuels still for the most part. And so particularly when you see countries like Germany turning back on their coal plants, when you see concerns about the squeeze that's coming through in terms of coal and oil supply and gas supply for the winter, I think we're really going to see the realities bite. And when that short-term reality bites... Yeah, the, the short-term reality bites finish off, and then I have a question on inflation. Sure, yeah. What, when the short-term reality bites, the problem you get is that the climate change action has to be pushed back because it becomes, you know, how do we get, get a new gas contract in place? And that time that's taken getting a gas contract in place builds up a long-term supply for that gas that may, in yeah. another world, have gone into renewables. And, and, Stephanie, overall, is the transition automatically inflationary to a point where, you know, we have some of the renewables cheaper otherwise? Well, this is where I think it really, I mean, what we've been really astounded by over the past kind of 20, 30 years was the expectation was solar was always going to be too expensive to be a really viable alternative. I think the bigger problem is going to be around storage. And we continue to see these issues. How do you store renewables so that it is a genuinely viable, complete alternative to fossil fuels, especially in the context of, you know, the kind of prices we're seeing with fossil fuels? And that has not been solved yet, which is going to be a big part of the economic picture around the long-term inflationary consequences of a renewable transition. Thank you so much. Stephanie Kelly, their head of thematic sustainability research at Red Wheel. Now, we also stay with the transition, but actually look at BP hiking its dividend and accelerated share buybacks to the fastest pace yet after profits surging. The oil and gas industry boosting returns to shareholders as the cash rolls in, even while the energy crisis triggered by Russia's invasion of Ukraine threatens the global economy. Well, joining us now is James Heron, our European oil editor. James, I mean, BP earnings were really outstanding. Are they doing better or, or worse than their peers? 
Uh, they certainly seem to be increasing the returns to shareholders faster than their peers. 10% uh, hike in the dividends plus a big acceleration in the share buybacks. Uh, a more significant acceleration than we saw from Shell and Total, its closest peers in Europe. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly giving a lot more cash to shareholders, the kind of returns they've been demanding for years and years now. Um, but obviously BP, because of the, the invasion of Ukraine particularly, is in, a, is in perhaps more of a weakened position because its shareholding in Rosneft, which it's being now trying to exit, was yeah. a, accounted for a big proportion of its oil and gas production. So that's also like on the, the detriment yeah. side here. So uh, does this, I mean, you know this inside out, right? What, what does BP do next? They were, they were going to be greener. Does this actually put in jeopardy that because shareholders are not happy because they're getting, you know, so much money from these cash cows? Uh, it doesn't seem to be putting that in jeopardy. They're, they're holding their capital expenditure plans pretty yeah. much the same, despite all this extra cash that's coming in, way more than they thought when they made these plans. Mm -hmm. uh, they're still talking a lot about the transition. They haven't made any really huge deals to, like, they're not buying any giant utilities or anything like that, but they say they're going to keep investing. Uh, there's no sign, really, that they're pumping extra cash into oil and gas right. either. So they, may, they say they're just going to stay the course, really. All right, James, thank you so much. As always, James Heron there with the very latest on BP. And actually, thanks to BP, the FTSE is holding stronger than others. It's still down some two tenths of 8%, but not as much as other European bourses. Coming up, Ukraine makes its first shipment of corn since Russia's invasion, a small but crucial initial step towards boosting global food supplies. That story is next, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition, we're looking at Hong Kong and of course we're looking at some of those HSBC headlines. The pressure has definitely been mounting on the bank ahead of the meeting with H, uh, Hong Kong shareholders. We just heard from the chairman, Mr. Tucker, apologizing to investors for scrapping the dividend, but he once again says that splitting up HSBC structures, which is what its biggest, of course, shareholder wants, Pingyang, will destroy value. That's according to Mark Tucker, the HSBC chairman. Now, on to Ukraine and it's made its first shipment of corn since Russia's invasion. It's a small but really crucial initial step towards unlocking the millions of tons of grains piling up in the country and boosting global food supplies. Well, joining us now is our expert on everything foreign policy. He's Mark Champion. He's our Bloomberg senior reporter for international affairs. So, Mark, good morning. This is a very significant step into easing these global food prices. Uh, it is. I mean, you already saw an impact on prices. Um, it has to be said that it's for about two weeks. This is just... Uh, testing so there's just gonna be a few ships for the first two weeks you know five or six ships um, and just to make sure that this is secure and that the, the routes work and so on the Ukraine is taking it slow after that it can really ramp up um, and you could see Ukraine exporting as much as half of what they exported last year um, Mary, you, I mean, you're really one of the experts also when it comes to Russia and, for example, the, the ties with China that historically weren't very strong that have become, you know, stronger mm. without the combination of China. Nancy Pelosi shows up in Taiwan. What does that mean for that relationship? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting one. I mean, I think one, uh, one way to look at it is we don't know exactly what lessons the Chinese have been drawing from the war in Ukraine, uh, what lessons they've been drawing from the Western response. Uh, from you know how Russia behaved, um, so you know, how they decide to take on Pelosi could tell us a little bit about that. Mark, thank you so much, Mark Champion. There with the very latest Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller, Kaylee Lines in New York, or Anna Edwards is in London, and this is Bloomberg. to visit Taiwan, and the Speaker of the House has visited Taiwan before, without incident. I think what has happened with Speaker Pelosi's trip is she has raised very high expectations in Taiwan, very high anxieties in China. I think it's a mistake for the Speaker to go to Taipei. The goal of, of foreign policy with respect to China 
is to reduce tensions, not to increase tensions. There's no reason for this to come to blows. There's no reason for this to erupt into some sort of conflict. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Tensions over Taiwan. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is expected to visit today. China threatens a military response. The markets react. Global stocks retreat while investors seek havens like treasuries and the Japanese yen. And another big quarter for another energy giant. This time it's BP, which raises its dividend and accelerates share buybacks. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. And Kaylee, a certain amount of angst now hangs over these markets. Absolutely. Geopolitical risk instead of recession risk is really what is front and center today, Anna, as the world kind of digests escalating tensions between the two largest economies in it. As we expect, Nancy Pelosi will be touching down in Taiwan in about five hours from now. So that definitely hung heavily on the Asian session overnight. Stocks really lower across the board. The MSCI Asia Pacific Index as a whole was down a little more than 1.2%. But of course, you saw China down, you saw Hong Kong down, and Taiwan's benchmark was down as well. Those stocks down about 1.6%. You also saw it show up in the Taiwan dollar, which is actually at its weakest level against the U.S. dollar going all the way back to May of 2020, trading uh, just under 30. And the dollar uh, is weakening, however, against the yen, really seeing that safe haven bid or perceived safe haven bid showing up in the Japanese yen. It is strengthening against the dollar now for a fifth day in a row. That's the longest streak going back to April of 2020. And right now, uh, just underneath 131, that is the strongest level for the yen in about two months, Matt. Yeah, you can imagine um, that markets are getting a little bit tense right now, obviously. It's not just Nancy Pelosi, but she's flying in with um, a fighter jet escort. So bringing American military power into uh, territory that China considers its own. S&P futures, as a result, down two-thirds of 1% right now. And, of course, we did close the session down yesterday in the cash trade, about three-tenths of 1%. Investors are buying 10-year debt right now. That pushes the yield down to uh, uh, 255, just about two basis points from a relatively high level. So you could see this move further, especially if tensions build. She's supposed to land there, I think, around 3.20 London time, which is, uh, what, 10.20 U.S. time. So um, just about an hour after the market opens. NYMEX crude down 48 cents and 93.40 right now, and Bitcoin down 1.4%, but still at 20 2,804. So um, obviously that's a uh, correlated asset, but really watching closely how China responds to the Speaker mm. of the House flying in with a military escort to Taiwan today. So Matt, in terms of the European markets, we are seeing some of this angst, but we're really in a bit of a limbo, aren't we? Waiting for developments, waiting to see if the House Speaker does, as we expect her to do, land in Taipei later on today, and then how China responds, as you say. So this is the response, this is the setup that we have in markets right now. We have weakness from European equity markets, but not in all of them, because we have other stories to deal with here, in particular surrounding earnings. Uh, let's have a look at some of the uh, moving parts when it comes to the European equity story today. So weakness, the broad theme, but you can see London and Spain are moving higher. The London market moves higher despite the fact we've got some weakness on oil prices. Uh, Matt was talking about the uh, WTI price. Here's Brent at 99 at 28. So we've dropped down below the $100 a barrel mark on the Brent uh, global benchmark. BP, the share price there, doing a lot of the heavy lifting in the London market. And this very much to do with the results that this, uh, this energy major has now reported up by 3.7% for this company in just today's uh, 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 session. Close to perfect is the way that one analyst described these numbers, except Exceptional is the way that the business describes its own trading performance over the last quarter. The highest profit in some 14 years. So some strength coming through once again. It's, it's in keeping with the narrative we've seen from these oil businesses uh, recently. And again, keeping with that nar narrative, the focus on return of cash to shareholders through dividends and buybacks. We put in the muller share price. We expected to hear from them tomorrow. We got a pre-announcement today. The, the, the results so good. The guidance upwards so extensive they had to pre-announce that. So up by 1.8% on the share price today. We will hear from the CEO though of this global shipping business in tomorrow's uh, programming and we put in the pound the focus really is on risk off and so the pound is retreating against the US dollar as part of a broader risk off trade but we're getting closer to that Bank of England policy meeting on Thursday the market expects 50 basis points but there are a lot of people saying actually maybe only 25 Kaylee. 
Yeah, I've heard that from a few guests over the last couple of days as well, Anna. And while we are looking ahead to that Bank of England decision on Thursday, there is also a lot to pay attention to on this Tuesday. Earnings will continue here in the U.S. You have Caterpillar, Starbucks, Airbnb, Uber, also among the companies scheduled to report earnings. Then we'll get some economic data with Jolt's job openings at 10 a.m. Eastern time. An interesting read ahead of Friday's payrolls report. Plus, Fed speak is on the docket. Markets are braced for commentary on that interest rate outlook. How much do they push back on the market? now expecting less aggressive tightening from the Federal Reserve. We'll hear from Chicago Fed President Charlie Evans, as well as Jim Bullard of the St. Louis Fed and Loretta Mester of Cleveland will be speaking as well. And of course, the big event of today that we've already mentioned, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is expected in Taiwan at 1020 p.m. local time on Tuesday. So about five hours and 15 minutes from now, according to a report, Matt. All right, it is Tuesday. Let's check in right now with our global team to get coverage of Nancy Pelosi's trip to Taiwan. Samson Ellis joins us, the bureau chief in Taipei. Bruce Einhorn, our correspondent in Hong Kong, and Joe Matthew, our Washington correspondent in D.C. right now. Um, Samson, let's start with you. What kind of response, I guess, are, are we expecting? Is Taiwan's military... Um, getting ready for Nancy Pelosi to land in Taipei. Well, they've come out with a statement to say today to say that they are ready. They have said that they are monitoring what appears to be increased activity in and around the Taiwan Strait, presumably from uh, People's Liberation Army uh, military assets. Uh, but they've said they've absolutely got the situation under control. As for the broader Taiwan, well, the response here so far is, quite frankly, a bit of a collective shrug. You know, people do welcome these types of visits. You know, Taiwan is a little bit starved of international attention. Uh, and so any kind of visits, like high-profile visits like this, uh, that Taiwan can, can get, you know, they'll happily take them. Uh, but quite frankly, right now, with the additional circus and the additional threats going on, um, you know, there are negatives for, for Taiwan. We've already seen today, for example, as well as this increased activity around Taiwan, uh, we have seen China uh, ban a whole raft of uh, food imports from Taiwan. Uh, and so they're really, you know, exert, attempting to exert further economic pressure on Taiwan because of this visit. Okay, Samson, thank you very much. That's the view on the ground then in Taipei. Samson Ellis, our bureau chief there. Uh, let's get to the China perspective. China, which regards Taiwan as part of its territory, has vowed to an unspecified military response to any Nancy Pelosi vi uh, visit that risks sparking a crisis between the world's biggest economies. China's foreign ministry spokesperson spoke earlier. The position and the attitude of the Chinese side has been very clear. China has on many occasions made it clear our position on this, and we have uh, made serious demarches to the U.S. side. We are also closely following the itinerary of Speaker Pelosi, and if the U.S. continues down the wrong path, we will take strong and resolute measures to ensure our sovereignty and security interests. Okay, some of the commentary there coming from China. Bruce Einhorn has the latest on China's response. And as we would expect, uh, the voices from the foreign ministry in China then, Bruce, giving some, some warnings about what could happen if uh, we do see Nancy Pelosi land in Taipei. That's right. So the foreign ministry spokeswoman uh, warned about uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi in the U.S., uh, working with uh, separatist forces. That's important because uh, China has uh, long said that one of its uh, um, one of its red lines when it comes to Taiwan is any formal independence declaration from Taiwan. So anything that smacks of separatism um, is something that the uh, Chinese are very concerned about. Um, uh, when, when thinking about uh, what China might do in response, uh, it's worth looking to last year when there was a congressional delegation led by uh, Senator Bob Menendez, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, uh, he uh, led a group to Taiwan. Uh, uh, China responded with uh, warplanes flying over, uh, flying into the eastern side of Taiwan. Um, uh, China has had uh, numerous flyovers into Taiwanese airspace over the years. Um, it's also possible that there would be uh, military exercises in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, uh, it's worth keeping in mind also that this is a uh, response that we might not see in days, but rather in weeks and months. This is something that's clearly uh, irritated uh, Beijing a lot, um, and there'll uh, probably be uh, repercussions 
for quite a while. Uh, the other thing uh, that China is probably also very concerned about is that in the United States, there really now is quite strong bipartisan support in Congress for Taiwan, probably stronger than it's been in, uh, uh, in quite a while. Um, uh, so uh, Nancy Pelosi's visit um, would just further emphasize the extent to which uh, Taiwan has really won uh, strong backing in Washington. All right, Bruce, thanks so much for joining us. Bloomberg's Bruce Einhorn there out of Hong Kong. Now, the White House urged China not to escalate tensions with the U.S. in response to Pelosi's visit, signaling that the Biden administration is bracing for Beijing to retaliate. John Kirby, the National Security Council spokesman, spoke with Bloomberg yesterday. There's no reason for this to come to blows. There's no reason for this to erupt into some sort of conflict. There's no reason for the Chinese to use uh, a potential visit by the Speaker of House as some sort of pretext to escalate tensions higher than they already are. And I would remind you that in recent days and weeks, it is the Chinese side uh, that has, through their rhetoric uh, and their activities, including this live fire exercise, the ones that are escalating the tensions. Joe Matthew, Bloomberg Washington correspondent, joins us now from D.C. And, Joe, it's all well and good to hear that um, from the National Security Council. But the bottom line is Nancy Pelosi is flying in with military jets to Taiwan, which is territory that Chinese considers its own. That's right, and I wouldn't expect an air show here over Taiwan, but there will be cover. General Milley has made clear uh, from the Pentagon, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, that uh, the United States will provide the security needed to get Nancy Pelosi there and back safely here. But yeah, the messaging was very deliberate when we spoke with John Kirby yesterday. Number one, he says there's precedent for this trip, albeit it's about a 25-year-old precedent. Uh, it's been some time since the Speaker of the House touched down in Taiwan, but also that there is no change in policy. They're trying to turn this back on the Chinese to make it clear that the drama is coming from Beijing, not the U.S., and that the Speaker makes her own travel plans, makes her own decisions. The White House cannot tell her not to go. It was pretty clear, though, from members on both sides uh, in Congress yesterday, Republicans and Democrats agreed that if she turned around now, it would be a very bad look for the U.S., and so they want her to go through with this trip. Yeah, tricky geopolitically for sure, Joe. And speaking of other geopolitical news, President Biden says a U.S. drone strike in Afghanistan has killed one of the planners of the 9-11 attacks. Ayman al-Zawahiri was the leader of al-Qaeda, and according to a senior administration official, the drone attack had been planned for weeks. We heard from the president yesterday. No matter how long it takes, no matter where you hide, if you are a threat to our people, the United States will find you, and take you out. So clearly, Joe, the president has had a lot of balls in the air dealing with the war in Ukraine, China and Taiwan, terrorism and threats in Afghanistan. And he also has to focus on his domestic agenda as well. On that front, on reconciliation, we're awaiting to see if Kirsten Sinema, the Democrat, is going to get on board. But we understand also the Republicans may have a few tricks up the sleeve of their own. Well, yeah, they're going to try to challenge components of this legislation. We, we still don't have the text in our hands, Kaylee, but we saw this. This is kind of the way it's done. We saw this with Build Back Better. There's something called the Bird Rule that requires, if you're, if you're taking this route called reconciliation, that it must be a budget revenue-related matter. So you can't just throw any attachment on there and, and have a party-line vote. Uh, we like to call it the bird bath here in Washington while they're scrubbing the legislation. And Republicans are going to use that to challenge each component. There was a thought, for instance, that the prescription drug pricing uh, plan may not technically count as part of reconciliation. Uh, the parliamentarian in the Senate is reviewing this right now. That's who handles the bird bath. And we expect to learn a little bit more in the coming days. It's unclear exactly when they'll finish this. But I will remind you that a lot of this has already been scrubbed because there are so many carryovers from what we called Build Back Better last year that the parliamentarian has a pretty good sense of what is in there. And Joe Manchin and Chuck Schumer, when they hammered this out, were very careful to not have extraneous uh, components that could be knocked out by the parliamentarian because time is running very short in the Senate. Joe, thanks very much, Bloomberg. Joe Matthew, you can listen to Joe every weekday on his radio program, Sound On. That's at 5 p.m. Eastern time on Bloomberg Radio. Turning to some corporate news now. Here in London, BP is hiking its dividend and accelerating share buybacks to the fastest pace yet. That's after profits surged on high oil prices. James Heron, Bloomberg is a European oil team leader, joins us now on set here in London. James, nice to have you with us. Uh, so this is the latest in a, in a series of strong numbers, I suppose, from the sector. Give us the highlights. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, 
virtually every major oil company has announced share buybacks. They've all had amazing profits. Uh, BP was particularly far ahead of uh, analyst estimates. It seems like its oil traders had a, an exceptional performance. Um, but yeah, much like the rest of the sector, crude prices are very high, natural gas prices are very high, the refineries are making amazing profits, and they're taking all this extra cash and they're mostly giving it back to shareholders. And of course, that's been a bit of a political problem for them here in the United States as the Biden administration has accused them of price gouging and prioritizing profits over consumers. Thank you so much to Bloomberg's James Herron. Now, as for some of the company stories we are watching here in the U.S. that are moving stocks in pre-market trading, I want to begin with one, and that is Pinterest, which is moving higher in a big way after reporting results after the bell yesterday. Not only did revenue and users come in better than feared, Elliott Investment Management also confirmed a major stake in the company saying it's supportive of its management. So that stock is up 19% before the bell. A lot of stocks, though, are moving lower today, including Intel. And there's a few things that are going on here. On the one hand, that CHIPS Act just passed in Congress would indicate that any chip company like Intel getting funding would have to stop investing in production in China. So that's one headwind. The other is getting cut to negative uh, on the outlook by S&P and getting downgraded to sell over at DZ Bank. So all of that together, taking the stock down by about 1.2% before the bell. And finally, a lot of Chinese companies listed here in the U.S. Those ADRs are under pressure as focus is so firmly on tensions between the U.S. and China as we gear up potentially in a couple hours from now uh, for Nancy Pelosi landing in Taipei. One of those being Alibaba. It's down about 2.8 percent before the bell, Anna. Kaylee, uh, coming up on the program, we'll get back to the markets then. Maria Weitmeyer joins us. State Street Global Market Senior Multi-Asset Strategist. What's her immediate response to the risk-off mood that we're seeing in these markets uh, and the longer-term prospects for equities? More on the tensions in Taiwan. We'll jo be joined by Elizabeth Braw, Senior Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Plus, the bitter breakup. Goldman accused a trading pair of accessing sensitive code while leaving for a hedge fund. They say they're being unfairly tarnished. Read more about today's Big Take story on Bloomberg.com or on the Bloomberg Terminal. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. We are simulcast on both Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg Television. And we're looking at a little bit of a sell-off in markets. It's mostly due to geopolitical issues, as far as I can tell, um, concerns about Nancy Pelosi landing Taiwan. At the same time, though, Zoltan Pozar from Credit Suisse has released another big deal kind of note, saying that the Fed could push to 5 or 6 percent and that markets aren't really looking at the right thing. Take a look at this uh, chart for those of you watching on TV. For those of you listening on radio, I'll walk you through it. It just shows the annual inflation rate, which has climbed, as you know, to 9.1%, as well as the Fed fund futures, um, just showing that the market expects about 4%, a rate of about 4%. And right now, of course, we're at 2.5% um, for the top value. But if we push to 5 or 6 that could be very damaging to the economy. Pozar says doesn't matter um, that the Fed would rather push us into a depression then risk losing the fight on inflation. Joining us now is Bloomberg Markets reporter Justina Lee. So, Justina, this is pretty serious. Yeah, I mean, Poser really is hitting back hard at the market narrative out there. You know, we have seen bond yields coming down again with kind of people starting to talk about peak inflation again and maybe the Fed dialing back, you know, that, those tightening moves coming up and maybe even cutting rates next year. But at the kind of the core of Pozar's argument is that inflation this time around is structural. And so, you know, we have to worry about the effects of, you know, slowing globalization or kind of less, um, you know, geographic mobility for workers. And because of that, the Fed is going to have growth slow for an extended period of time in order to really bring down those inflation expectations. Mm. And of course, all of this happening at a time where we're dealing with another I mean, it's not new, but it seems to be new today, a level of risk aversion in markets surrounding geopolitics in Taiwan. Right, exactly. I mean, today really is, you know, a textbook case of risk aversion. And one effect of that is Treasuries are rallying further. And so there seems to be like multiple support for this, you know, rebound in government bonds right now. And I think, you know, those tensions are also reminding people that if we do see kind of 
you know, the potential of a conflict, I mean, that could have economic consequences as well if, you know, there are further disruptions to the supply chain as, we, as we've already seen mm. in the Ukraine war. Justina, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Justina Lee with the latest on the markets. And for more market analysis, check out MLIV Go on your Bloomberg terminal. This is Bloomberg. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. In China, top leaders have said that this year's economic growth target of around 5.5% should serve as guidance and not a hard target. Bloomberg's learned that government officials were told there won't be penalties for failing to reach the mark. Economists have warned that China's growth will come in at 4% or lower. And the U.S. is sending Ukraine another arms package valued at $550 million. It includes more ammunition for an advanced rocket system that was sent earlier, as well as 75,000 artillery shells. The Pentagon says the U.S. has sent roughly $8.8 billion in military aid to Ukraine since the start of the Biden administration. Coming up, we will keep a focus on geopolitics, how it influences a market that is thinking actively about earnings and recession risk as well. Maria Vaitmana, State Street Global Market Senior Multi-Asset Strategist, will be joining us next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Tensions over Taiwan. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is expected to visit today. China threatens a military response. The trip will make Pelosi the highest-ranking American politician to visit Taiwan in 25 years. The markets react. Global stocks retreat while investors seek havens like treasuries and the Japanese yen. And another big quarter for another energy giant. This time it's BP, which raises its dividend and accelerates share buybacks. The company posted its highest net income since 2008. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. And Matt, there are other stories, corporate stories going on today. But really the focus for, for every asset class seems to be around the geopolitics and around that impending visit. Yeah, and I mean, as it should be, right? Considering the fact that we're sending the U.S. Speaker of the House into Taiwan with a military escort, and we've got a strike group um, in theater uh, ready to take action. I feel like the gravity of the situation hasn't quite hit markets. We're only down uh, two-thirds of a percent on S&P futures, and considering we were up almost 10% last month, um, and we had a fantastic last week of June as well, we've come a long way, baby. So we're at 4,100, basically, on the S&P, and uh, if we have problems, you could expect us to fall a lot further. Some investors are getting into 10-year yield as a safe haven, but not too many. We're only down two basis points right now to 255. Um, we were just down at 240 at uh, the beginning of yesterday's session. And right now, um, the U.S. dollar index is climbing, but only a smidge here. That's the technical term. 1264.89 is the level on the BBDXY. Bitcoin is down as it's correlated with risk assets, but it too is only down from uh, a, a relatively high level to 22,741. So not really testing its limits at all, Kaylee. It looks like things are holding up pretty well. Yeah, well, one thing, one group of stocks, at least not holding up very well this morning, Matt, is those Chinese ADRs, Chinese companies listed here in the U.S. Those really reflecting what we saw in Asia overnight, which is a real tampening of risk appetite uh, in that region as we look at the tensions between the U.S. and China. So stocks like Alibaba and Baidu, each under pressure in early hours, each down in the ballpark of 2.8 uh, percent, percent or so. You're also seeing a lot of the tech space under pressure. That includes some of those chip stocks like NVIDIA, which is down 1.5 percent, and then other just large cap technology stocks as well, including Tesla, which has its own China sensitivity story, of course, Anna. It is down about 1.5 percent in early hours. Yeah, lots of China in the U.S. markets, it would seem, to keep an eye on. Uh, Kaylee, let's have a look at where we are on the European assets this morning. And the Stocks Europe 600 down by six-tenths of 1%. Uh, that angst around geopolitics, very clear to see across European equity markets. But are we in something of a holding pattern, waiting for the next leg of this story to develop? And that is the arrival of the House Speaker and, indeed, any Chinese response. Brent crude, then, down by seven-tenths of a percent this morning. And I put this in the board because we've just gone below that $100 a barrel mark over the last 24 hours or so. 99.28 is where we 
trade. The BP share price not responding to that, responding to the numbers that BP reported this morning. So putting out these numbers, the highest profit in some 14 years. We got a big, uh, a big profit from the business. We got a big dividend uh, increase and a big share buyback increase. So the latest in a theme coming through from these big energy companies. And Muller Mex, the huge co uh, container shipping giants, will speak to the management of this company in programming tomorrow. Uh, but they uh, pre-announced some of their numbers. They had to upgrade guidance to the market and the stock is up by 1.6% then, Matt. All right, very interesting uh, moves then, corporate news as well. Luke Ellis, the CEO of asset manager Man Group, says he is cautious about the second half. He spoke on Bloomberg earlier. I made a, what, what sounds a cautious comment about what's going on in markets, because yeah. I think markets are, you know, clearly markets have been very volatile in the first half. Clients don't know what's going to happen in the second half, and institutional clients are trying to work out what to do. Inflow side of the equation looks very strong through the second half of the year. But what are clients going to do about their overall portfolio? I think anybody who would say they know is, yep. is guessing. Meanwhile, Credit Suisse strategist Zoltan Pozar is warning the U.S. economy may need to undergo a deeper and longer recession than investors currently anticipate. In fact, he says the risks are such that Powell will try his very best to curb inflation, even at the cost of a depression and not getting reappointed. Maria Feitman, a senior multi-asset strategist at State Street Global Markets, joins us now. Maria, what do you think about the, the Pozar note and the idea that you know, the market has it wrong. The Fed's not going to go just to three and a half or four and then turn around. They could go to five or six. Yeah, Matt, that's exactly what I think. I think market is a little bit too optimistic about uh, us seeing uh, slowdown in data that will be some sort of like shallow recession and that would be enough to arrest inflationary pressures. That's, I think that, that that's possible, but very, very optimistic. That's possible, but optimistic. T tie that thought, those thoughts, Maria. Good morning. It's Anna in London. Tie those thoughts into what we're seeing today for us, Maria. Uh, risk aversion across global assets. We see the yen uh, moving to a two-month high. Where would you expect to see developments in these markets, given the, the, the geopolitical tensions that we're now having to factor in, as well as concerns about inflation and growth? No, absolutely. Inflation and growth are key concerns. And I mean, maybe I kind of elaborate a little bit on the... Uh, too optimistic view on the market is, uh, uh, I mean, we, we see inflation uh, pressure still being strong. So we track online prices that they're, they're still strong. They're not really showing many signs of slowdown outside kind of falling fuel prices, which is oil, oil, oil price driven. Majority of sectors still seeing quite a lot of inflationary pressure. And on the growth side, Yes, there are some parts of the particular U.S. economy that are already in recession. We have like negative GDP, technical recession. But there are other parts of the economy that are still fairly strong. So we've seen uh, labor market being strong. Industrial activity is still not weak enough. Uh, corporate earnings, again, they are kind of stories of uh, have and have not. So companies selling to more affluent consumer, larger businesses are doing better than the ones selling to mass market. So it, it is not kind of black and white. So economy is slowing, but not slow enough, so we're not yet in recession. Uh, mm. uh, inflationary pressures are still there. So it, it's still, as, as I said, it's too optimistic to expect like slowdown in the economy already being there and prices not going yeah. higher. So we expect more uh, tightening of financial condition as that's not great for risk. Not great for risk. Another thing that might not be great for risk, Maria, might be further decoupling. Uh, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but clearly relationships between uh, the United States and China not mm. strong and not improving. Further decoupling of the global economy, I suppose, on a very medium-term horizon, would that be inflationary? Uh, possibly, possibly, because, I mean, we've already seen kind of uh, last year kind of a breakdown of supply chains that hasn't helped anyone. And if there are some sort of retaliation, particularly economic retaliation, that uh, kind of some uh, tariffs, some... Uh, kind of shop, uh, stopping of certain shipments can, can, can potentially be on the cars. I mean, we already heard that some of the Taiwanese uh, food, food uh uh, food, food exports have been blocked uh, by by by, chi uh, by China today. So that that sort of action will, will, would would give uh, kind of policymakers kind of additional headache. Absolutely. Well, Maria, obviously tension between the U.S. and China is weighing on risk sentiment broadly today. But we've already kind of seen this 
big recovery in stocks. So I'm wondering if what we're seeing now is just a fading of the rally that is going to resume or if you ultimately think that really was just a bear market bounce and it's back to just the bear market part of that story now. Yes, that's, that's, that's kind of our general thinking. So we would fade in general. We would be fading, uh, fading July rally as, as kind of we're thinking that uh, kind of uh, decline, uh, like fall, fall in uh, rate hiking expectations was uh, was premature. So we would be fading rally even without geopolitical tension. That's, that's, that's definitely true. And just thinking regionally, we've talked about China. We, of course, have Europe facing the gas risk and perhaps an inevitable recession. We talk so much about whether or not there is an alternative to equities, but is there an alternative to the U.S. right now? I mean, I have to say, we, we liked U.S. equities for, for a long time for the kind of better quality of companies, better ability to generate profits, more dynamic markets. It hasn't been, I mean, U.S. has uh, underperformed rest of the world this year, but we think that uh, what investors should, where investors should be hiding uh, if uh, kind of slowdown is coming is in the better quality companies, larger caps, and U.S. Has, uh, has lots of those. So, so we, we, we still like U.S. relative to the rest of the world. You U.S. Uh, value? Uh, no, not entirely sure about value. I mean, the largest component of value is financials. <laughs> you probably know that we are not big fans of financials. Uh, we still think that flat yield curve, inverting yield curve, makes it very, very difficult for banks to make money. We, we're worried about uh, uh, quality of the loan books as they, they kind of continue to provision. So. Uh, Value X financials, yes, <laughs> but overall value is challenging. Maria, thanks so much. Thanks for joining us. Maria Weitman is joining us there from State Street. Coming up on the program, we'll get back to the uh, geopolitical tensions in Taiwan. Elizabeth Braw joins us, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. What kind of Chinese response would she expect to see? This is Bring Back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, the CEO of Marriott International. That's at 10 a.m. in New York, 3 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Well, U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is expected to land in Taiwan later today, defying Chinese threats of military action. The trip will make Pelosi the highest ranking American politician to visit there in 25 years. And China regards Taiwan, of course, as part of its territory and has vowed an unspecified military response to a Pelosi visit. Elizabeth Bra, resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, joins us now. Now for more. So Elizabeth, obviously China has made threats here. We heard Xi Jinping last week warning President Biden about playing with fire and getting burned. But Xi Jinping and really China as a whole is dealing with a number of domestic issues. The COVID zero policy, the turmoil in the property sector. There's, of course, the party, party Congress coming up this fall. To what extent do you think those things may temper any kind of retaliatory or provocative action from China? Well, Kaylee, a visit like this was always going to cause a lot of bellicosity from Beijing, simply because, as as, uh, as we all know, uh, China, uh, the, uh, the People's Republic of China, does not recognize uh, Taiwan as an independent state. So if, if a foreign politician goes there on an official visit, uh, they will react very angrily. Uh, but it's also in nobody's interest to, to, to stoke uh, a World War III, which is, uh, has been the concern uh, all this week that, that, or, or, and, and the preceding week that, that this will uh, cause a war because the Chinese will react so uh, massively to, to this uh, visit that is supposed to, to start uh, uh, tonight, local time. So uh, as you say, Kaylee, uh, there are a number of other issues that, that the Chinese government has to deal with, including the COVID response and disrupted supply chains. And so it's not really in their interest to make this a bigger, uh, to make this into a global conflict as they would uh, by responding militarily. Uh, it, uh, that said, they have responded very provocatively well, uh, by flying uh, very close to, to uh, Taiwanese airspace. Well, and aren't, aren't uh, the aren't the Americans being pretty provocative? I mean, why fly in with a military escort 
and a strike group in theater. Um, I, I guess you could say for her defense, but clearly against the Chinese army, it doesn't matter if we have a, uh, you know, a, a pack of F-35s around her, they're not going to win any kind of conflict, so it would just start a war. Well, the, 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 in the U.S., uh, so the first step was that uh, Pelosi announced this visit, and the moment she announced it, the U.S. government had responded, including the armed forces had responsibility to look after her. They wouldn't be able to say, well, you go on your own. <laughs> We're not going to have anything to do with this. So it puts the Biden administration and, and military commanders in a very difficult position. The, the Biden administration can't exactly tell her not to go. It's her prerogative. She doesn't work for the government. Um, so that is really the unfortunate setup. If, if I were her advisor, I would have said, you know, just go to Singapore, then make an unannounced visit to Taiwan. But clearly, uh, she had other advice. Um, but the, the point is that the U.S. military has an obligation to, to protect office holders going to foreign countries, even, even if, if that the paradoxically uh, might stoke a military response from the other side. And, and Matt, that is a really perilous moment we are in at the moment. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think it's fascinating here. Um, what happens if China, I mean, they, they have to respond somehow, right? And we hope that it's not um, a military conflict. What, what are the, the other options for the Chinese response? Well, we have already seen today, the, the day isn't over, but we have already seen Chinese aircraft flying just to the dividing line with Taiwan. And we have also seen Chinese uh, military vessels going all the way to the dividing, the, ter the unofficial ter territorial water dividing line uh, between China and Taiwan. So just not sailing into Taiwanese waters, but uh, staying there at, very, at, at the border, the unofficial border between uh, 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 maritime border between the two countries. So I think we'll see more of that. We could also, for example, see uh, Chinese drones flying into Taiwanese airspace. How would Taiwan respond to that? It's not a a full-blown military attack, but it's also not nothing. And I think, mm. uh, Matt, because uh, Nancy Pelosi represents California, represents San Francisco, I think we could see some very ugly retaliation against uh, Californian um, uh, IT companies, tech companies. That is Nancy mm. Pelosi's constituency. They won't like it if China retaliates against okay. them. That's really interesting. So we'll look to see if we get anything like that then, Elizabeth, on the economic side. In terms of the time horizon, over what horizon do you think we would expect to see the Chinese retaliate here? I wonder, this seems to be something that, the, that those in the markets are trying to wrestle with. Yeah, so and I think the, 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 we would be foolish to think that if, if she comes... If she arrives in Taiwan, then leaves without a world war having broken out, that we are fine. China has, the Chinese government has showed over the past few months and indeed years that it takes a long view on things. So, for example, when Sweden announced that it wasn't going to include Huawei in 5G, nothing very much happened. Then a few months later, it emerges that Ericsson has had, Ericsson of Sweden has had a massive, a massive loss in their sales uh, in China, where sales everybody went, everybody else, everywhere else in the world went up. So clearly, China was retaliating against Ericsson very quietly uh, over several months, and so I think we could see uh, responses like that against uh, against companies based in in California, and and indeed okay. other responses as well. But the, the the commercial side is where I would look very closely. All right, so the commercial side, that's interesting. In other developments overnight, Elizabeth, we've, hear, we've heard President Biden confirm that a U.S. strike in Afghanistan over the weekend killed the current leader of al-Qaeda, or who was the current leader, was the leader of al-Qaeda, Ayman al-Zawahiri. Uh, the, the Americans, of course, call him a longtime terrorist commander who helped plan the 9-11 attacks. He took responsibility for the London bombings in 2005, which killed 52. Are there further developments to watch on that front, Elizabeth? Yeah, so if we think back to the 90s, when uh, there really weren't any threats to America at all, this is, uh, 
this is a reminder, the killing of uh, Zohir is a reminder of how dangerous the world has become. He was, of course, one of the masterminds of the 9-11 attacks. But today he is just, he and al-Qaeda are just one of many major threats against the U.S. And the reason that he was killed, that the um, Americans killed him with this drone strike, is that al-Qaeda remains a major threat to the U.S. and indeed to the wider world. So it wasn't a matter of, of the U.S. being able to say, well, we killed Osama bin Laden a, a few years ago. Al Qaeda doesn't pose a threat anymore. It does pose a threat. And Afghanistan clearly was providing um, was providing refuge to uh, to him and to other Al Qaeda leaders because he was living there very openly and so openly, in fact, that that the U.S. could find him. So it is mm. a reminder of how perilous and how dangerous the world has become. So it's it's Al Qaeda, it's Russia, it's China, and let's see about Iran and North Korea. Okay, Elizabeth, thanks very much. Lots to discuss, sadly. Elizabeth Braw of the American Enterprise Institute. Coming up next hour, Julie Norman, University College London Centre uh, for US Politics. Uh, she will be joining the team. That's at 6.30 a.m. in New York, 11.30 a.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lines in New York. Also with us, Tom Keane, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. And he joins us now with a single best chart. And I'm sure you're reflecting on the, uh, the, the theme that seems to be hanging over almost all assets this morning then, Tom. Good morning. Really quite historic. Goes back to my youth and all the tensions that you had with the China of long, long uh, ago. This is a spectacular chart. Let's sit on it for a while. This shows the rate of change, the growth of per capita Taiwan in U.S. dollars and per capita China in U.S. dollars. The huge ascent of China since the visit of Newt Gingrich in 1997 and how China has narrowed the gap towards a prosperous Taiwan. Taiwan makes up a shocking 1.7 percent of the population of China, and they've been the machine that worked for decades. Tom, uh, I'm sure you've got some great guests lined up because this is real tension. There could uh, be serious consequences here, so we need to prepare. There are global consequences as well, but I think we've done a lot over the last number of months thinking of James Stravitas, of course, with all his work in the South China Sea and Robert D. Kaplan, uh, who has done uh, so much as well. We'll take an equity bent today, but we will look with Julie Norman of UCL not only at what's going on in Taiwan, but also the death of a member of Al-Qaeda. All right, well, we will look forward to those conversations. Tom Keen on Bloomberg Surveillance, thank you so much. Now, as for what else we are watching today, I will be watching the Fed speak because there is a lot of it. And basically what I'm looking for is, do they push back on a market that now expects them to be less aggressive and possibly even cutting by the time we get to next year? First, we'll hear from Charlie Evans of the Chicago Fed. That's at 10 a.m. Eastern. Then Loretta Mester of the Cleveland Fed at 1 p.m. Eastern. And Jim Bullard of St. Louis will round things out at 6.45 p.m. Eastern time. But really interesting to see their language considering the hike we saw last Last week of 75 basis points and the press conference after was perceived mm. as dovish by the market. How dovish or hawkish do they sound today, Matt? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if they address Posar's notes because a lot of times the credit Swiss strategist sounds um, uh, shocking, but to throw in the word depression really mm -hmm. raises, uh, raises the bar. I'll be watching Nancy Pelosi in Taiwan. Obviously, when she lands there, it should be 1020 Wall Street time, 320 London time, um, to see what the response is when she flies in with a military escort because we haven't sent a speaker there in, I think, 25 years, and I'm not sure if the last speaker uh, brought mm. fighter jets. Right, and we'll be looking for what China, what China's response looks like. Our colleagues doing a good job of keeping us a, a, across all of the possibilities. Could we see bigger warplane incursions, flying warplanes over Taiwan, diplomatic, economic retaliation? All of that very much in focus for programming in the hours ahead. This is Bloomberg. <laughs> 